to unbox our lovely dot cards here. So this is the collection of 238 from Daniel Smith. And I've been using their colors for about 10 years now, but amazingly enough, I've never gotten the full dot card. And the colors normally come in tubes about this big. This is a 15 milliliter tube. This is about a pretty brand new one right here. I haven't used very much. And it comes with quite a bit of paint. So you can see compared to that here, you have just a tiny, tiny bit, but it should be just enough to get a kind of a general idea of what these colors will look like on our paper. Let's go ahead and take a look at what we get inside of this package. And don't forget to recycle your plastic film, cut off little pieces of paper tagging and recycle it. So inside of this thing, we get different dot cards, a little piece of paper explaining how to use it, which we do no longer need. Then we have our reds, yellows, and oranges. Then we have greens, purples, blues. Oh my gosh, so many. This looks like a page of mostly earth pigments. Although I see a couple of yellows here that I would have thought would be in the yellows. And then of course this, ooh, look at this last page bunch of different really cool looking black colors and then some I've never tried all of their interference and iridescent colors so the super shiny ones those will be quite a trick to try so looking forward to that and I think one of the most useful things that we get with this set is this little guide here to all the different colors so it's the ones that we have that we'll be swatching out soon and what's really useful about this is that it gives you this kind of key up here that talks about what the little symbols mean beneath each of the colors. So there's kind of a couple different properties of watercolor that really impact you know, how we use them and how long they'll last. The first one is the light fastness rating. So I only ever use you know, colors if I can that are in the excellent, the numer numerical uh, one light fastness and they're excellent so they'll last for 100 plus years. Um, I try to avoid anything below a two. That just doesn't seem like a very good choice for longevity and archival paintings. Then the colors will also have a different property that's called staining or non-staining. So that just means if you imagine taking that paint, sticking it on a cotton shirt or your cotton paper, how much does that paint really stain the paper and how much can it, or can it be lifted out of that paper if it's a non-staining pigment? So they have one through four from non-staining to high staining. And granulation, this is a very useful one. So you should look for the little Y or N for yes or no. And the yes will be in varying degrees. So not all paints will granulate to the same degree. And we'll get to see that with a bunch of these fun colors. The other one that I really like to pay attention to is transparency. And what this here just means is that the paints will have different levels of transparency. So how much does the light filter through or how much is the light blocked by that pigment when it, when it goes onto the paper? And a lot of paints are going to fall somewhere in the range of, you know, the semi-transparent, transparent, or opaque. That's a good thing to be aware of because that will really change how these colors mix and how they interact together ultimately inside of a painting. And once we have the kind of key up here, then we can look down below to see those different properties in action. So for example, we could look at my in yellow right here. It has a light fastness rating of two, so very good. It's a non-staining pigment with the number one. It's an N, so non-granulating. And then it has the little open circle. So it's a transparent pigment. Oh my gosh, and the last thing <laughs> that's useful to pay attention to is this little number on the bottom. And this is kind of deceptive and you really important to look at because if there's one number and like a couple letters, that means that this pigment is a single pigment mixture. So it only has one component in there as far as what's making the color. And a fair number of them are like that. There are, however, some like this one Moon Glow here that is made of three different pigments. And what happens is that if we start creating mixtures that have paints that already have a mix inside of them, it's harder to control what happens with that mixture. So my personal preference is to almost always work with single pigment colors. And I have one color right now that's a mixture, but other than that, I prefer just to kind of stick with this ones where I know what I'm mixing and it makes it easier to kind of keep track of what I'm actually doing in that color mixture. So that's our little key here. And this will be super useful. I'll be referring to this throughout our painting today to kind of see what's in the different paints, checking if they're single pigment or multiple pigments as well. Okay, here we go. So I wanted to start with a color that I knew well, so I can kind of just as a baseline just to make sure that things are behaving the same way that I'm used to. My paintbrush, I think, is all the way clean. So I'm just kind of smearing my paintbrush across the dot to agitate some of the color. And that gives me enough to be able to try out a nice little color swatch over here. 
I think what I'm going to do is end up doing a color swatch of this color at a really high concentration and then one next to it at a lower concentration. So there's our Hansa Yellow Medium at kind of pretty much as dark as it can go. So you can see it's a really nice deep dark yellow color. I use this one a ton. It makes really, really vibrant, clean, bright mixtures. It's also semi-opaque, so it kind of can create nice effects in a painting. And I want to thin that color down just a little bit more. And there we go. There's our Hansa Yellow Medium kind of all thinned out across the page. All right. Next up is going to be Buff Titanium. This is a color that I ended up adding to my repertoire, I think last year, and it became one that was actually pretty popular for a lot of coastal and desert paintings. I was really surprised by that, honestly. I didn't expect to enjoy it as much as I did. And let's see, I'm lifting some of that off. This one's a little bit harder to get it at full concentration from the dot. So I think I might grab my palette over here which will allow me to get this color at its more full concentration. So for where ones I have the color, I'm just going to go ahead and do that and grab some extra. And some colors like this one, when they dry, they tend to dry just a little bit kind of stiffer and harder to agitate the color off the paper. So this is definitely one of those. So there's buff titanium at its kind of highest, darkest concentration. And then if I thin that out a little bit, we can see that color goes quite a bit lighter. This one really shines in mixtures though. Very rarely did I find myself using it alone as just a single color on the paper. So it's something I definitely prefer to mix with. And next up, let's see, we have Nickel Azo or Nickel Titanate Yellow. This is one I never tried, brand new one to me. It looks kind of funny on the paper. It, it looks like it's tending a tiny bit greenish. So I'm kind of curious to try. Interesting, it's a really pale yellow. I don't know if I like this color <laughs> that much. Um, I'm getting some kind of pieces of the base paper scrubbed a little bit off of it. So it's definitely not my favorite I've seen so far. It has a very, very greenish cast to it, um, which could be useful in some circumstances, but it just doesn't strike me as a very versatile color in some ways. It's also kind of pale. So I'm gonna try thinning it down even more. Yeah, I mean, it goes down to a really nice pale yellow, but I honestly can't see why I would buy that color or use it. It's just not the prettiest yellow, especially compared to like these range over here already. It's not that fun. Rinsing the brush and switching over to Mayan yellow now. This is one of the yellows so far that we've seen that actually is only is light fastness too, so it doesn't have quite as good of a longevity rating. So as a result of that, you know, I would probably skip that one. Mayan yellow is gonna be down here. In first glance, it looks a lot like Hansa Yellow Medium. Like, it really does. It's a bit of a warmer tone. It's tending more toward the oranges or toward the reds, but it has a very similar tone to it. It has, it's transparent ostensibly, but it does seem to have kind of a, to me, it feels a tiny bit opaque compared to kind of like Hansa Yellow Medium. So let's see. There it is watered down. Meh, again, like, it could be a nice color, but I think for... It's, it is more kind of orangish and less greenish, which is nice, but I, it's not my favorite I've seen so far. So let's keep going back to, we'll stay to the left side of the column here and take a look at these more kind of yellowy tending colors. So here's a bismuth vanadate yellow. Getting a lot of that one on the brush. Very interesting. This one is opaque and it's the most opaque one we've seen so far. And you can really see it on the paper. It looks almost like a white or like a yellow gouache, which I find really interesting. So I can get a really deep, dark color there. I'd be really tempted to try this one white gouache out of curiosity just to see how it looked. It's a really interesting color. It's quite light. It's quite staining too. So that's kind of cool to see. And good light fastness, but huh, that's kind of an interesting one. You can already start to see kind of the contrast between Hansa yellow, which is, or Hansa yellow medium, which to me is more of kind of a nice like mid-tone yellow. And then these two yellows that tend more toward the kind of greener side of things. The same thing holds true for our next color, which is Hansa Yellow Light. This is a color I have. I don't use it very often. Um, I got it kind of on a whim and over time just realized that it really wasn't my most favorite color. It's semi-opaque. It doesn't have as good of light fastness either. So I might be tempted someday to replace it with the Bismuth Vanadate Yellow, which just seems a tiny bit more interesting <laughs> with the extra opacity there but it does tend toward a kind of really nice light color. It makes beautiful mixes for the kind of the glowing yellows and greens and ice. 
and that's when I use it the most by far. So this is kind of my go-to to mix really soft, delicate teals for icy mixtures. Up next is Azo Yellow. Let's try this little guy. And I'm really having to scrub these on my little, uh, like kind of scrub, scrub them with the paintbrush. So I'm using an older paintbrush here so I don't kind of dull down or mess up one of my newer ones as much. So Azo Yellow, let's take a look at that one. Huh, this one looks very similar. <laughs> when it's wet to our Hansa Yellow Medium. Uh, it's definitely a tiny bit less greenish tinted, so you can see how it's kind of going more toward the orangey side of the spectrum, but it looks very similar to Hansa Yellow Medium. I'm gonna thin it down a bit and see if that holds true, even in a thinner concentration, it does. So, and you know, it's maybe, I would probably still stick with Hansa Yellow, but it's an interesting one to try. I think either one of those could be used, at least at first glance, interchangeably. I would have to check in an actual mixture to see, but for now they look somewhat interchangeable. And I'm being careful to rinse my brush quite well in between our color swatches here, so I don't get any tainting from one to the next. So our first, this is our first cadmium here, and it's actually a cadmium yellow hue, so it's cadmium yellow light hue, and that hue tells us something really important. That tells us, that this color is not actually made from cadmium anymore, which is great. <laughs> I would not want to use a paint that was a cadmium because it would just mean that you'd have heavy metals floating around your studio and that would not be safe for anyone or anything. So Daniel Smith says that this color is has been in production since 2000. And I personally ended up kind of using the Hansa Yellow Medium because I found, you know, I preferred to not be using one that had the cadmium in the name just, be, just because of the confusion and kind of the bad connotation but they're they're safe and they are you know aren't going to hurt you because they're a mixture of let's see this one has three different pigments in it and it has um, secondary light fastness so that's another reason i prefer hansa yellow medium to cadmium yellow light but it's an or, or to medium but it's an interesting kind of semi-opaque color it looks very similar to the bismuth vanadate i'll be curious to see how it dries i know some artists who love this color so maybe someday i'll try it but apparently the hues like this are made by they call it a process called co-precipitating i don't know enough about chemistry <laughs> to know what that means but apparently a co-precipitated color will behave like a single pigment color even though it has you know, multiple components to it. So that, what that means in practicality is that that color would probably mix much more like a single pigment color than a multiple. So I, out of curiosity now, I want to try cadmium yellow medium and to see how that looks compared to our Hansa yellow medium. Let's take a look at this little guy. Very, very similar. And I had picked out Hansa yellow medium after having talked to an artist who told me that they liked it as a nice alternative to the cadmiums. Um, Again, just because of the kind of the connotation that the cadmiums carry, even though they're safe to use. And I'm getting some like little kind of chunkies from this paper. So I wish Daniel Smith had used a more robust backing for their dots because in order to get the color off in high concentration, you really have to agitate that paintbrush on there and it's just disturbing the paint a lot and taking little paper pills with it. So that's something I wish they would have paid more attention to and tested better would be to see how that would work well or not. So, you know, that one looks very similar to Azo Yellow. It was a little bit harder to kind of get that one disturbed from a dry patch. So maybe in a palette where you wanted that, an Azo Yellow might be more effective because it's easier to re-wet. That's something to think about too, is how easy is it to get this color off of the paper? All right, we have Areolin Yellow next, or Cobalt Yellow. This one is, looks, looks kind of like, eh, it's pretty, like, it's a nice, trans really beautiful transparent color. It's having a hard time getting really, really dark. So you can see I'm having to really kind of agitate that color a ton, scrub it across, bring it back over, <laughs> go back and forth be between the two. I wish I had the actual wet paints from the tubes to try. That would be way fun. But for now, I can get a decent idea of how the colors behave. There's a high concentration and a low. Eh. It looks it's slightly less green than like we saw in the nickel titanate or the hot, you know, the yellow, the light yellows, but it's, it would make a really nice glazing color. I bet like the areola might be a really nice mixture for that one. Um, next up is a true lemon yellow. So it's gonna be, 
lemon yellows in my experience t usually tend toward being a slightly more greenish in concentration. So I'm going to grab this little guy and let's see if that holds true. It does. So it's going to be just kind of slightly more, if you imagine these colors on a color wheel with very slight differences, the lemon yellow will kind of be on the more greenish side of the spectrum. And then the other colors like the cadmium yellow medium and the Hansi yellow medium will be a, kind of on the other side approaching our slightly more orangish, but ever so slightly. So there's lemon yellow. Meh. It's fun to see how similar and how different some of these are. So far, the most different is buff titanium, which is fun to see. Next up is cadmium yellow deep. Ooh, this is pretty. It reminds me a lot of New Gamboge, honestly, which makes sense because New Gamboge has Hansi yellow deep in it. So that's kind of a fun color to see. That one lifted super easy out of the palette. So that's nice to see uh, or off of the paper. This one I could see being useful in like desert landscapes or wherever I kind of wanted just like a really vibrant kind of deep yellow tone. Um, I love, that's, my, that's my favorite new one I've seen so far compared to the other colors. I'll move on to Naples yellow now. This one looks pink. <laughs> it looks like a very yellowy pink color. So I'm very fascinated by this one. Let's see. Similar to some of the other colors, I'm having a harder time kind of getting it off of the page and I'm really having to work to agitate that off. So just something to think about when you're practicing and playing with the colors. This one, meh, it's kind of like a raw chicken color. <laughs> Honestly, um, not my favorite I've seen. I feel like I could mix this color pretty easily by using maybe even buff titanium or a little bit of gosh, like even a tiny bit of white gouache. I feel like I could really mix that color pretty easily myself. And it makes sense that I would think about using a white gouache in that one to mix it because it's semi-opaque. So that's kind of why whenever you add white gouache, it changes opacity. So that one, as it's drying, it's getting more yellowish and less pinkish, but it's still, I don't see myself using it as much. I feel like I could mix something very similar with buff titanium and a tiny bit of pink and a tiny bit of yellow. So I don't think that's one <laughs> I will add. Here's Indian yellow. I would really love to know why they call them Indian yellow. It's like an Indian red. We have to look that one up. Um, I wish they would find a different way to address them that didn't use a term for indigenous peoples. Um, but this is a really pretty color. This is a mixture of three colors and I'm really curious which ones it would be. So I might pause and look up what's in this mixture that's giving it such a nice deep color to it. And here is the light version of that. And there we go. Very cool. That one's a really beautiful color so far. That one I think could glaze really, really gorgeously. Okay, so a little bit of internet research revealed that this Indian yellow is made from Hansa yellow deep and a nickel azo yellow concentrate. So that would make sense why, hopefully, when we try Hansa Yellow Deep next, we will get to see that these two colors look pretty similar. I wouldn't be surprised if the Indian Yellow trends more toward the greenish side though, because of that uh, Nickel Azo Yellow, which we have a version of on our paper as well. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at how orange this is. Wow. <laughs> that is an orange color. <laughs> so Hansa Yellow Deep is crazy. Look at that. <laughs> Did not expect that. That is so orange beautiful and that one is also semi-opaque which i can see the minute i put it on the page it just covers really really well but that's a crazy color of yellow <laughs> it's bordering on orange for sure our next one is new gamboche i know this color really well i love it it's one of my perennial favorites just mixing it up, up right here on the paper it does have a definite feeling of similar similarity to the Hansa yellow deep but it does have a slight bit more luminosity and kind of yellow tint to it, meaning, which I just mean by that is like, it's a tiny bit maybe greener a little bit. So curious to try this one. This is a color, a new to me color as well. So far it looks pretty orange. I'm so curious. Wow, it looks even more orange. So one of the most confusing things about colors is that brands can use the same name, but it can have a different component in it. <laughs> so that does not help us in terms of our color exploration journey because it makes it much more and more confusing as we go. So Iso Indoline Yellow from Daniel Smith is PY139. It feels very, very orange, like the oranges we've seen yet. 
Um, so far of those three, my favorite is that Nougat Vosges mixture. It feels like a nice happy middle zone between kind of the more yellows and then having the orange cast to it. Permanent Yellow Deep is up next. Very curious about this one. Starting to get even more orange. Look at that. That really looks no different to me <laughs> compared to the ISO Indoline Yellow. Like what? It looks so similar. I wonder if it has a similar componentry. It doesn't seem to have the same stuff. What I wish Daniel Smith did is I wish that on this sheet they had the pigment number. And that's a major oversight. So you have to go look at their little pigment guide off to the side, flip through this thing, total pain in the butt to be able to find the next you know, yellows that we have. Okay, mystery solved. I was reading my color chart wrong, which is easy to do when they don't put the stupid colors on this one. So the reason that New Gamboge felt like it was more of a yellow and less orange is because it had Hansa Yellow Medium, this one up here, plus Hansa Yellow Deep, which is really interesting to me because it tells me that if I wanted to, I could just get rid of Hansa Yellow, or I, I could get rid of New Gamboge in my palette and replace it with Hansa Yellow Deep and possibly have a more versatile arrangement of colors so that I would, could, could get the full spectrum of the Hansa Yellow Deep. There's a permanent yellow deep. Interesting, but me, you know, pretty similar to all of those. Um, down at the bottom here, I have two colors that will show up later. Daniel Smith put them with the earth pigments, but I want to show them off now. And that's going to be my quinacridone gold. Oh my gosh, mine's all dirty. So the color that I wanted to share with you in, in addition to the other yellows was quinacridone gold. And you can see, and the reason I wanted to show on this page well, just to show how different it is at high concentrations. It stays away from the kind of overly vibrant oranges. And then when you lower the concentration of that color, it becomes this beautiful yellow that looks very similar to like Indian yellow or maybe even Mayan yellow, kind of somewhere in there. So I find this color to be super versatile. It makes these incredibly beautiful greens. And it's one I've had in my palette for about 10 years because I love it so much. So I highly recommend that color and I find it to make really just spectacular mixes. Um, the other color I want to share was this yellow ochre. Again, this is one that will show up later in the color swatch exercises. The yellow ochre, I just want to put it here because it, is, it has the name yellow in it. <laughs> and I want to show just again, kind of the spectrum of how different these colors can look because this one, you know, is kind of like a more dulled down version of maybe like our cadmium, cadmium yellow deep or maybe even kind of our Naples yellow, but it's granulating and I don't like it very much, to be honest. It's just not a very great color. I'm going to ditch it from the palette pretty soon and replace it with a different yellow. I just don't find it to be the most versatile color, so it's not one that I use very often. Um, but that concludes our yellow. So now that they're starting to dry, we can look more through them. And so far, I'm still really smitten with the colors I have. My main yellows are quinacridone gold, Hansi Yellow Medium, and I use New Gamboge, although I am now seriously considering switching out my New Gamboge for a Hansi Yellow Deep. So that way I could have the full versatility of this color with, and then I could mix it with Hansi Hansi Yellow Medium <laughs> if I wanted that. So I'm very curious to try that because Hansi Yellow Deep is just PY65. So that will be interesting to try. As far as the other colors, you know, I, I don't mind having Hansa Yellow Light in my palette. It's pretty, but I don't use it very often. So I'd be tempted, I think now, seeing that this one has only a light fastness of two, I think if I buy it again, I'll switch it out for either um, for my lemon yellow, just so I can keep that really nice transparent yellow, or for possibly Bismuth Vanadate, this one right here. I think it has a very similar color to Hansa Yellow Light, but it's going to have that light fastness of a one and it's going to have full opacity which Hansa Yellow Delight doesn't. And it'd be kind of fun to have a fully opaque yellow in my palette. So this is one that I'm very curious about. And it dried kind of interesting. It feels almost textural on the page. Oh, look at how quinacridone gold just looks like such a beautiful color. It looks almost orange down there but then it just thins down to this gorgeous yellow which is really unlike anything else in this kind of upper portion of yellows that Daniel Smith put together. So I'll circle back to that one. And then just for fun to share some of the mixtures that these colors can make. So these are a bunch of greens made using New Gamboge and my some of my favorite uh, colors in my palette for blues. So for example, here this one is New Gamboge and the Thalo Blue Green Shade gives amazing blooming. And then you combine New Gamboge with Cobalt Blue and you get a really different color and a lot of granulation. 
So this is what I was talking about in that, you know, the way the different properties of the colors will really impact how they behave in mixtures. And on the other side, we can look at new gamboge mixed with some reds. It gives us a really beautiful range of kind of deep oranges, but then it doesn't behave very well mixed with like a gray or even mixed right here with some, you know, Indian red. That Indian red is going to settle out and will make kind of you know, it's just like, it, it won't mix as much with the yellow. They'll kind of stay on their separate sides of that zone. And then here's that yellow ochre, and I wanted to show this one just to show why I don't like this as a mixing color, because you can see most of the mixes are really dull, and then it really resisted mixing as well. So when I combine it with a non-granulating color, I see that the yellow ochre just settled out to the bottom and then just left all the other colors just kind of floating on top. Like this color mixture here with cobalt blue, just worked terribly. <laughs> I really did not enjoy that whatsoever. Um, the only mixture I really liked was yellow ochre plus thalo blue green shade. I thought that those two did integrate into a really pretty turquoise here in the middle. And then this one, the textural effects worked well. And I think that had something to do with the very fine particle size of the thalo blue could integrate well with those larger particle size of our yellow ochre. And then again, so here's another comparison. This stuff over here is Hansa Yellow Light. And this is also a pretty good illustration of why I don't use it very often, just because it makes it greens that are really artificial feeling. Like some of these down here are prettier when it mixes with the more granulating colors or an in, in Indian throw in a darker blue. But all of these up here with the thalos just don't work very well. <laughs> and even with ultramarine, it's not my favorite. Um, I would use that just like very selectively in really early, early spring or kind of high, very prominent sunlight on certain landscapes. And then as far as our quinacridone gold, I think it's pretty easy to see why it's one of my favorites for mixing natural, gorgeous, vibrant greens while still maintaining a kind of lovely earthiness to that color. And you can see that and how somewhat similar some of the mid-tones are, but they're just gorgeous mixtures. And it just behaves super well. It's really predictable. It plays nicely, unlike that uh, yellow ochre we saw, the quinacridone gold plays really nice with the other colors. So it integrates well, it mixes well, both with granulating colors like ultramarine blue, but it also mixes just stunningly with our really fine particle sizes of our thalo blues. So we are continuing on now with our oranges and into our reds, and maybe even into some of our purples and into our pinks. So kicking, kicking things off, we have an Aussie red gold, which isn't too different at first appearance from that permanent yellow deep right before it but it was very easy to agitate off of the paper, so that's kind of fun. This one's also a mix of pigments, unlike some of the other things we've seen so far. So we had kind of a nice string there of colors that weren't a mix. And this one is a mix of a yellow, a transparent red oxide, and a quinacridone violet, which is a good thing to keep in mind just because, again, you know, this will have a kind of bigger variety of pigments in it, so it may behave less predictably if we're working with it in a mixture with a bunch of other colors. And there's that color swatched out in a low concentration. It was a really nice contrast, honestly. I wasn't expecting that to be kind of a, what a beautiful range you can get from that color. So that one's a fun one. Although I personally would probably avoid it because of that mix. I think I'd rather just get my hands on either one of those two component elements. So for now, we'll be avoiding that one. Um, pure old orange. Ooh, look at that. That's crazy orange. It's like traffic cone orange. Oh my goodness. So here's pure old orange and wow. <laughs> was not expecting that one to be. <laughs> look at that color. It is vibrant. <laughs> Let's take a look at that one and water down a little bit. So at a lower concentration, it's starting to get really reddish, which is interesting. So we've kind of gone from the more yellow side of things to now toward the reddish ones with that color. I don't really know what I would use that color for, honestly. Like, it's so bright. Uh, it's not something that, like, I, I would have to try it in more mixtures first, honestly. So I will withhold judgment until I get to try it. And here's permanent orange, which this one is not a mixture. It's a single pigment. Good light fastness. Let's try it out. Um, looks pretty similar to our permanent yellow deep again, but I do enjoy just, like, this one's a pretty interesting orange, actually. It's like a very, I can see this one being more useful. Like I, this was one I might, so far of like the orangey oranges, <laughs> technical term that, 
that we've seen so far. This is the first one I've tried out where I have seen it and been like, okay, that's one that I might actually try just because it, I could see it being very interesting used in mixtures, especially for greens. Next up, we have cadmium orange. This is again one of those cadmium orange hues, which means it's a mixture of other pigments that gives it the ability to, you know, work with, you know, be, or like, it's a mixture that gives it the ability to be not made from heavy metal crazy stuff and then still be a bit a lot, lot safer while still retaining supposedly a lot of the original color qualities. There's high concentration, and then here is a low concentration version of that color. And it looks, it's definitely more reddish than our permanent orange. It's not as red as pure old orange, which this is going to be kind of redundant given that I have a scarlet that I kind of think reminds me a bit of that one. The cadmium orange is quite pretty. It seems like of the colors we've seen so far, it seems like the most kind of what you think of as like a truly neutral orange. So kind of right in the middle of the spectrum. So here's Paranoan orange. This one looks ooh, very similar to that pure old orange. I'll be curious to see it swatched out. So here's this little guy. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> it's funny to see them all next to each other and just how similar they are. But this one I noticed right away and it's semi opaque. So it has a very, very dark and like tone to it. It has a lot of covering power, I think. So it's really pretty, but I don't know why I'd use that one, I think. This one might be more versatile still, but that's an interesting color. I mean, I'm very curious to see these in addition, in addition to the reds, so I can just see how different they are from each other. So here's our cadmium red scarlet hue now. So once again, a mixture of some different stuff together, but supposedly it performs just as well as a single pigment color in mixtures. That is a true beautiful neutral red, like really, really lovely. Um, I have a different red that I use quite a bit. That one just looks like a blood red. <laughs> so I thinned out like that, like, ugh, <laughs> that's very accurate, actually. Like, if you get a paper cut and smear it on the paper, it looks just like that. So that is a definite uh, scarlet red color. If I thin it out a little bit, we can kind of see some of that lighter tone better. I'm very, like, I'm going to be curious to see how the cadmiums dry, because the cadmium yellows felt like they dried a little bit more dull than some of their counterparts. So I'm very, in like, very curious to see how that one dries. This is transparent, transparent pure old orange. Wow, look at that. That is a very fascinating reddish orange. But th look at how different it looks also on this paper over here versus thinned out a tiny bit on my swatch page. So that's a very interesting thing to note. And some people will just swatch them out here and not bother bringing them to a separate piece of paper. But I want to mimic more closely what it's like to go between a palette and a paper. That one is actually a really pretty orange. So far, it might be my new favorite. It's slightly more reddish than the permanent orange, while also retaining like a really lovely kind of vibrancy to it. So that one might be the new winner in my book so far. That one's quite pretty. I'm enjoying that one quite a bit. The contrast of the dark version to the light version is also really lovely. So I do appreciate that. Let's take a look at organic vermilion. I have no idea what makes it organic. Oh, that's a cat hair. What fun. Anyone else here have cats? Cats just make all the painting things harder. <laughs> Their little furs get everywhere. So this is again, organic vermilion, single pigment color. This one, however, is that little number two. So it's a light fastness number two. And personally, I'm going to shy away from colors with that rating just because I've seen some independent tests from some artists done where a couple of Daniel Smith's reds that were of that light fastness to definitely faded faster and they could see the difference in direct sun. So for that reason, that's one that I probably wouldn't use. And it's just, it's kind of redundant, I think, with some of the other colors. I feel like I could mix that by adding, just like watering down some of the other truly light fast reds. And Mayan orange, this, this is interesting. So when I looked up Mayan colors, I was re reading about it on Daniel Smith's website and they were saying, I quote, that they use methods derived from ancient Mayan chemistry. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> like, there is no supporting information about what that means to be derived from ancient Mayan chemistry. Um, the only other information they had was that these, quote, unique metal-free pigments uh, are made and recreated using an environmentally friendly process. So they're obviously going to be synthetic or probably synthetic pigments, I would guess, from some kind of chemical process, like most of our really vibrant paints like this are. 
Um, but <laughs> I don't know about that one. I would definitely, it has a light fastness of two. It's semi-opaque. So again, it's one I would personally skip. It looks really, really similar to that cavy red scarlet hue, like especially wet, they look really, really close. So I'll be curious to see how they dry and see if those are, have a similar approximation in once they're dry. And that concludes our yellow and orange section. Woohoo! So many fun colors to test out.